All right, this is the College of Complexes. And if you wandered in under the uh, impression that this was a regular restaurant, well, it's that, but it's something more than that, too. It is the college. And we are going to hear tonight uh, from Charlie Earp about the Socialist Party USA. Uh, he is contending that we should build the Socialist Party in Chicago and the USA. All right. All right. Without any further ado. No, I want some further ado. Oh. <laughs> we will hear from Charles Earp. Uh, here. <laughs> Hi everybody, um, many of you were probably here back in December when I did my presentation that Jesus made me a communist, which was about my life story. This is not my life story, this is, um, but if, in summary, I am a member of the Socialist Party USA. Um, actually, that's a recent thing for me. I just joined last summer after considering it for many years. And so I'm going to, part of what I'm going to talk about tonight is why I think it's a good time to bring the Socialist Party back into politics and uh, particularly in Chicago because we, we'd like to make ourselves more visible, to get involved in more events, and to put out there what socialism can mean in the United States. Um, first of all, if you... Uh, I'm not going to read it in full, but we have our own statement of principles as a party, socialism as radical democracy. This is available on our website, which is spusa.org, I believe, is our website. Um, if you want to pick up, uh, we have, sorry, I'm a little, there was a stack of the socialist, which is our, our monthly paper, um, that is still published every month. And you can get in here, um, particularly the statement of principles, and I can read sort of what it says. Socialist Party strives to establish a radical democracy that places people's lives under their own control, a non-racist, classless, feminist socialist society where working people own and control the means of production and distribution to democratically control public agency. So um, the Socialist Party goes back over a century. Uh, it started out as the Socialist Party of America, which was actually came out of the labor movement. Uh, about a hundred, I think it was 1901 or 1900. It was actually founded in the city of Chicago, that original Socialist Party of America. And you've probably heard the name Eugene V. Debs. He was the most successful third party candidate in history, and he was with the Socialist Party. And a lot of people believe that the um, agenda of the New Deal was stolen from Eugene V. Debs by Franklin Roosevelt. Um, so we have had an influence beyond our small size. We're not a big party. We never have been very big. Um, in the 60s, of course, we got involved in various anti-war, but we did split. And so technically, the Socialist Party USA today is not the same as the Socialist Party of America. There was a split in the 70s between the Democratic Socialists and the Social Democrats, and then a group that didn't want either of those started the new Socialist Party USA in 73. And we're coming up on our 100, how, how many years has that been, Art? For, it, for the, the new, new, the new SP for, USA. 40. 40 years. And that take me a moment to point out Art Kazar, who is our local Chicago contact guy. Yeah. Uh, Give me money. He's the one who actually helped re, re create the Chicago local of the SPUSA in the 70s. Been around, so you've been with the party many years. So if you have questions about the party, and I will probably get some things wrong because I'm new to the party, although I've read a lot. If you, if you, he'll correct me. You, you, you can stand up anytime and interrupt me and say you're wrong about that. Um, all right. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about who, what, when, where. Um, why do I think we need a socialist party? Of course, the biggest reason we need a socialist party in the United States is because of the economic crisis that we've been going undergoing since 2007. 
jobs are being reached out of the economy. Uh, automation is making it virtually impossible to have a full employment economy. So we need an alternative to capitalism. And what that looks like, I'm not going to tell you. I don't have a blueprint for it. I think what people need to do is come together democratically through something like the Socialist Party, through something like local assemblies and councils, through different kind of groups to rethink how capitalism operates in our day. Of course, the unions, at one point in our history, unions were a big sight. And as we know, you should know, maybe know, since the 70s and 80s and 90s, there's been an assault on unions, and unions have rolled back to where they're a tiny sliver of what they used to be in the United States. And that's something we should address. And you need, at this point, you can't go to the unions to create a socialist or workers' rights movement. So I want to see, I think, that's why I think we need the Socialist Party in there standing up for workers. Now, what about the Democrats? I think we, again, history has shown that since the 20th century and beyond, the this, this Democrat Party has not really been a friend of the working people. They've given us a program here or there, and of course they've, they've given a lot of money from the unions, but at the same time, they're in bed with the same people who have taken the unions apart. Um, political campaigns are currently um, funded by wealthy people, Wall Street, and so if you want to get elected as a Democrat or a Republican, you've got to get these rich guys to pour money in your campaign, and if that's what happens, you're not going to be in there campaigning for working class issues. So I don't think the Democratic Party, uh, despite some of the issues that we agree with them, you know, we are pro-choice party, we are um, a, we support same-sex marriage, but, you know, we, we, that's about all we have in common with the Democrats anymore, because they are they have moved decisively to the center and even to the center right of the United States politics. What about the Greens? I was a supporter of the Greens. I've been a supporter of the Greens since early in the Nader campaign. Uh, he, Nader campaign, of course, put the Green Party on the map, and they were a good alternative throughout the, you know, throughout the past decade and a half to the to the um, Democratic Party. But they never could unite against on what I think is the real threat to the environment, which is why they. The Greens, our identity is around the environment, but they can never unite on what really drives the death and destruction of the planet, which is capitalism itself, which drives people to extract resources and burn fossil fuels for profit, which is throwing our whole climate into danger. So I don't, I don't understand why the Green Party is never really united around an anti-capitalist agenda. And that's why I think we need the Socialist Party in there, because we have... We have a disaster over there. Because <laughs> we have stood for an alternative to capitalism, again, since the early 1900s. Um, another point that I want to make about, um, well, so to get into this, what, what can a third party do? Because if you've been involved with the Green Party, and I suspect a number of you here have, you know how difficult it is to fund or pull off a campaign, especially now that we have the Citizens United decision where you know, the Republicans and the corporation can throw as much money as they want into advertising for their particular candidate. Um, but, so I, I'm not, I don't have the illusion that anytime soon we're going to have a socialist that's going to win a majority in any a given election. That's not what third parties do. Now, if you look, I mentioned that Eugene Debs had a lot to do with how the New Deal took shape because he had a lot of people voting for him in the, in the, in the era prior to the Depression. And um, so, so I don't see the Socialist Party as necessarily becoming the leading party of the United States any time in my lifetime. However, a third party changes the debate, especially as we saw Ralph Nader do in the 2000 election. Now, people blame Ralph Nader for the loss of uh, the election. Huh? Or the Occupy. I will, I, will bring in, I will bring in the Occupy movement. I think the Occupy movement is a great yes, symptom of our present economic crisis. And, um, but, they, but the Occupy movement is having trouble sustaining itself beyond you know, the year that it, had, that it was all in the headlights. We all, the left is in pretty bad shape. And the, <laughs> so the socialist... Um, what I, my goal, and I actually did some numbers in my head, is that, well, I don't think the Socialist Party in the next 20 years can necessarily win a majority. Um, however, a big economic downturn, if we have another one of these downturns,
pressures like we had in 2008, 2009, people may have to start saying we need a new socialist party and we need to put uh, a socialist in office. But what I think what we really do is, we, is that we sort of undermine this idea that, well, the Democrats and Republicans, the majority of people agree with their politics. But if we're in there putting our voice in there, we can have actually, what I would like to see the third parties, and I'm not just saying the Democrats and the, or the Socialists and the Greens, but I think that, of course, the Libertarians and the Constitution Party, you may not know what the Constitution yeah. Party is, but they're a right-wing party okay, that's even more right than the, than the Republicans. So you have the, con the Constitution Party and the Libertarian Party. Well, boo, but they, but they help to do this third party effect that I'm talking about. You've got the, the Libertarians and the Constitution Party drawing votes away from the Republicans. You've got the Greens and the Socialists drawing the votes away from the Democrats. And at some point, if people really get behind third party politics, the, the Democrats and Republicans won't win a majority. And it, it's already could have happened in some local races. I haven't looked at this. And so that, to me, is the first step is to strengthen third party politics so that we can deprive those two leading parties of a majority in some uh, elections. So that's, that's sort of, I see, a more first step, what a, Demo what a third party can do, is weaken this, this legitimacy of the people who are running the country. For me. Um, so I want to go through a little bit here some of the principles of the Socialist Party and why I think we need to support it. Um, why I'd like to encourage people to support it, and I seem to have got up here without one of my, oh there it is, all right. So this is, socialism is a radical democracy, and do you know what year art, this statement was ratified? Was it? it can be, it's being updated every convention a little bit. Yeah, but I, I, I kind of remember this, this came out like in the 80s or 90s, 80s. so it's been around a while. Yeah. Um, and we stand, here's just our principles, we stand for freedom and equality. A lot of people don't associate socialism with freedom because they think of the, the Communist Party and how we had a centralized production in that country and there really were no unions independent of the state. We're not talking about this. Socialist parties never stood for that kind of centralized uh, economy. We believe in freedom, but we believe that capitalism isn't freedom. And that's what the big lie that has been preached for century now, that capitalism is really freedom. We don't believe capitalism is really freedom because it's only freedom for really rich people. Everybody else has to work 40 hours a week at a job they don't really like to get a paycheck that doesn't meet their bill, bills and needs. And we're, in a, we're currently in an overproduction situation. Capitalism right now could abolish every ounce of poverty in the world. We could retool all our production and get rid of the threat to the atmosphere and the environment and to the continued um, destruction of the planet. But capitalism won't do it because there isn't a profit in it. So it shuts down factories rather than create new jobs. So, I mean, I believe we could go to a 30-hour work week worldwide right now and, and nobody's standard of living would change except people who are really poor who begin to get a job because we've cut, cut back on the number of people working. Most people in the United States work 40 hours plus to get, to get an income, unless they're unemployed, of course. So I, I think that capitalism right now, the Industrial Revolution has made the productive capacity of capitalism, so, or, or the economy, so powerful we don't need the profit motive to keep expanding the economy. We need something other than the wage labor system that we currently have in place. What exactly that would look like, there are lots of different proposals out there, and I'm sure in the question and answer time, people will, will want to question that. But I want to emphasize that we do believe in freedom and equality in the Socialist Party, and it's democratic. We don't believe in a central government imposing Socialism. We believe in people coming together at the local, state, national level to democratically decide what socialism should be in this country. We believe in production for use, not for profit. I've kind of covered that. We do believe in full employment. Um, we believe in worker and community control and ecological harmony. Um, we also, of course, are strong feminists. We call ourselves a socialist feminist party. We do believe that women are, the, are an excluded element of most working class and union movements of the past, and we want to bring women into the movement. Uh, a statistic many of you may not be aware of, but 50% of the American workforce is female now. That's a historic first. Usually women were, you know, didn't work full time, and they were, um, many of them were uh, underrepresented in terms of the actual work they're doing, because they were what? Raising families, raising kids, 
And now, more women work outside the home than work inside the home. We're at, or nearly, it's nearly at, at that level. Um, and so we do believe that feminism and women's rights, and this is National, this is National Women's Month, isn't it? Or is it just, it's just, it's just ending. <laughs> just ending. Um, and we, we know we support that. And so we are for feminism, not the old feminism, which was all about the working, you know, the unions and, and the family ways. Do family ways clean? days are gone. Please. Um, we are also a peace party. We have, um, we've always had a strong pacifist current in the Socialist Party. We're not uniformly pacifist. You'll find debate over this. But generally, we oppose every war, if not on pacifist grounds, on economic grounds. And if not on economic grounds, on international relations grounds. Most wars the United States undertakes are for the interests of the defense industry or the or the military, but not necessarily in the interest of the working people of the United States. We do practice internal democracy. This is something that's different from nearly any other socialist organization out there. If you join, I don't want to name names here, but there's all these little socialist parties around. We, they are not democratic. They make you pay news and sell newspapers, and you take your party line from the guys at the top. So we don't do that. We've always been a bottom-up party. <laughs> um, and there are other things in here, cultural freedom, the personal is political, and of course electoral action. That's another thing that sets us apart from most of the, those little socialist parties you may have run across. Um, we, are, we do run candidates in as many elections as we can find willing people. We've actually, this year we won our, we had a school board member in New Jersey, one of our first successful campaigns in I don't know how long since we've had somebody holding office. But in, in the history of the Socialist Party, of course, we've had a governor. Uh, Mayor of Milwaukee was a Socialist Party member for many years. Frank Zeigler. Frank Zeigler. So um, we, we, we have a history of... of Webster Hohen. Yes. <laughs> so so we, we don't... We're not like a lot of these parties that say, oh, don't vote, just, to, you know, just organize for the revolution, whatever that means. We don't believe that. We believe you do engage with the electoral arena. Um, and I, and I, you may have noticed from my last time, I talk fast and I don't talk long. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't talk long. That's really kind of what I wanted to say. Um, and and then we're get, I'm going to go ahead into the question and answer, but I kind of got to make sure I've covered what I thought in advance I want to cover. Um, That's, that's kind of where I'm going to let it, let it go, because I don't have a lot to say. I think my argument's simple. It's on its face. You can understand it. Tim, you have? Yes. All right. Well, that are, one. We, are we starting question and answer? Is you it, can if you want. Did, did you have a question before that? Uh, I have a question when the question and answer starts. OK. You have a question? All right. So he's trying here. He wanted to be on first on the question and answer. At any rate. I have a question before the question and answer starts. Okay. Uh, just, just for the benefit, just for my own benefit, can you summarize this one more time? The, and again, as simple as one sentence summary, the main principles of the party. Okay. And, and what actions are currently being taken question. to turn those principles question of the law into practice? Of the Thank you. I, I, actually, I should mention this. I meant to, I had this in my notes, and I, I almost overlooked it. Um, probably the we're going to have a national convention in the fall. We have it every two years in off election year so that we can prepare for the upcoming election. So we're going to have our convention in the fall. Um, we also run a presidential campaign national, nationwide. We ran Stuart Alexander in 2012. In 2008 we ran somebody else. But Stuart Alexander ran this year. He's a African American from California. And his, um, his uh, vice presidential Candidate was Al was Mendoza. Is it um, Alex Mendoza? Alex Mendoza from Texas. So it's interesting that we were one of the few parties that ran a biracial ticket. You know, we had Latino and African American, um, which I thought was really powerful because it's all you know the Democratic Party. If you didn't vote for Barack Obama, you were probably racist. Well, forget that. I voted for Stuart Alexander. Um, so that's one of the big things that we do nationwide. Um, and of course, we want to run in local elections, but that depends on there being a healthy, vibrant local. And that's one reason I'm telling, giving this speech, because I want to see if we can rebuild the local here in Chicago. We're the oldest 
uh, Socialist Party locals, although you've got to take into account the, the splits and so on, but we've been around a long time. And I'd like to see the party attract a new generation. And um, But here's the principles. As I say, this little leaflet which Art brought tonight, and you can find this on the Socialist Party website, sbusa.org. Um, but basically, we're radical democracy. We are non-racist, classless, and feminist. We believe in freedom and equality. Production for use, not for profit. Full employment. Worker and community control. Ecological harmony. Women's liberation. International solidarity and peace. Internal democracy. Cultural freedom, which is about art. And I didn't really talk about art and history. Um, personal is political, so we believe in you know, individuals uh, being involved in electoral action and democratic revolution from below. Does that get, get, you, get you there? All right, all right. Um, well, I'm not doing the question. Am, am I doing the question answer? I guess I, Brown, I, guess Brown, I am do the, doing the question answer. Brown will be moderator. Oh, Brown will be the moderator. Okay. <laughs> but your first question, you have all these. Do you need a hand? Okay. Put the money down, then you get, you get it. Uh, exercise is very important. <laughs> okay. You have, right, so Tim? you have all these lofty principles. Right. Uh, like worker control of democracy, uh, workers controlling the means of production, equality. Mm -hmm. How, uh, first off, how are you going to implement these policies? And second, how are you going to pay for them? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, I believe that, that the present state of the industrial productive forces in the world is enough to eliminate want and need and hunger. We've been at that position at least since the 70s. But what happened in the 70s? Capitalism went into a profit crisis. And so what did they do? One, they organized the Ronald Reagan campaign because they wanted to capture the presidency. And they um, began attacking unions. Why? Because they wanted to roll back wages and be able to take people's wages down because they wanted they had to increase profits somehow. And the only place they could get the money was out of our wages. Wages in the United States have been flat for 40 years, but productivity has gone up. Why has that happened? Because unions haven't been there to, to stand in the way of this search for profit. So I don't believe that there's no money out there. I believe it's all going to the top tiers. And the, the goal of a socialist party and a socialist movement, and the Occupy movement put it very well, the 1% versus the 99%. And I actually believe it's bigger than 1%. There's more than, you know, probably 5 or 10% that are living off the fat of the land, and the rest of us have to struggle for scraps. So um, I don't believe there's no money. I believe that the, the, the economic crisis that we're going through is because there, there's no way to increase jobs for everybody when automation is reducing the need for hard labor. For most labor can be replaced with a machine, or much labor can be replaced with a machine. So we need something other than giving people a wage as a way to give them their basic living. And ideas like a basic income guarantee, which was Richard Nixon even believed in, basic income guarantee. So something along that line, I think, is at least a starting point. Um, and again, I believe in doing this democratically. I don't believe in anybody creating a polling bureau that, that sends down directives. There may be a few industries that need to be centrally managed, but most of them probably don't. You can do it from below. Yes, I am. Those principles are beautiful. I mean, whoever is not doesn't believe in me must right. be an asshole. Right. So, but now, how? The question is, what is your plan? How are you going to really uh, get even five percent of them? If you uh, granted that you said you are not. Um, going to go the evolution way, whatever it is, right. but you're going through the system. Right. Now, the system, the political system that you are, you want to blend in, will never let you in. And even if it will let you in, um, would you have enough mullah to, to grease the uh, lobbies to get any social change done? Well, I, there are a lot of lobbies that are sympathetic to parts of this. Again, I think one of the big problems is, is all the money that are in the campaigns. 
Um, and you can't run for office if you're not a millionaire. I mean, except maybe for local offices. But national offices, you've got to have a huge war chest. You've got to have big, fancy donors. And I think that's one of the reforms we need to do. I'm not opposed to the idea of a revolution. I, I will say this. I believe that it would be great if the working people of the world, of the U.S. and the world, could just all unite and say, we've had enough. We're taking the reins of power back to ourselves. But I don't, you know, I, you know, you look at the history of the communist parties and what they, they, they tried that in, in Russia, and we know how that went. It turned into the bureaucratic control of the working people. And they've had country after country follow that model, China, Cuba, Vietnam. And, and the world is not any step closer to revolution. But is there anything in between? Well, I think there is, but I, I, I think there has to be. What that is, I don't think I have the answer, but I believe democratic organization, if working people start coming together, even though we don't have the money that the rich guys have. Like changing the campaign uh, funding. Yeah. Well, this is why I was sort of talking about this scenario where we deprive a third party, the third party movements. We've got four significant national third parties. At least I think the Socialist Party is significant. You can disagree. We're the smallest of those four, maybe not the smallest. But if we could deprive the Democrats and Republicans of a majority in some in some important elections, then they're going to have to rethink what they're doing. And I think that that will open the door for a chance to reform campaign financing. You know, personally, I wish we were like England, where England has, you know. Um, Elections are handled, uh, election advertising is handled, I guess they have like a, well, maybe they used to, maybe this has changed, but it used to be they have a week of campaign through BBC, and everybody got their, their campaign and got that all out in about a week of television, publicly funded advertising, and then everybody voted and it was over. You didn't have like this year-long campaign that Barack Obama and Mitt Romney just put us through. So um, I think that's, so I, I don't know that I've got, there are people working out there for ballot reform, for campaign financing reform, and I support all those movements. I'm not an expert on any of that stuff. What I'm mainly what I'm talking about here is well, what what what's the vehicle that will stand pat against capitalism? And the Green Party isn't doing that. The Democratic Party sure isn't doing that. And I think we need the Socialist Party in there as one of the voices in the political system. You know, I don't, I'm not looking for a win in the national scale. You know, I, I mean, Ralph Nader was a big deal in 2000, but then he got a lot of blame for the loss of the Democrats, which I can argue that point. The Democrats lost that election on their own. Actually, the Supreme Court stole that election, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> you, you so far mentioned that the Greens are not anti-capitalist. Right. What two points? What else are the differences between the Socialist Party and the Green Party? Okay. And before, and in addition, has there been any serious attempt to merge the two? Yeah. And, and, and what has been the result huh? of that? I mean, in other countries, right? For instance, in Israel right now, the guy who became the okay. Prime Minister everything there. joined with several Is other parties on, mm -hmm. um, on the right and the Apple. left. That's it for pie. Why can't the left unite Coconut, sometimes? Dutch Apple, carrot, I mean, and the Green cake, Party basically oh, has the same like direction as a Socialist Party. Right. Oh, you got a fork. I would you say this. Um, a small glass of milk. As I say, I, I actually, for the entire uh, decade of okay. early 2000s, going back just be some point uh, before Ralph Nader's 2000 presidential election, okay. I supported the Greens, and I still support oh, an environmentalist politics, but I think Thanks, it became clear to me along around 2007, 2008, that capitalism was really the problem. Even though I believed that before that I would have called myself a socialist within the Greens. But what seems to me is happening is that the, so the Greens, and there are some really great left-wing socialist Greens, but I just became frustrated with um, what was happening in the Greens. I mean, I don't know, you may know, Art knows a little more about this, but we got kicked off the ballot in Illinois for the 2012 election by the Greens. The Greens filed an objection to our petition. We had one petition with one signature. We're not a big party. We don't have a way to mass organize a, ma a statewide campaign drive. 
I don't know if you know this, but to get on the presidential ballot in this in the United in, in Chicago, if you're a third party, it takes many more signatures than if you're a Democrat. Democrats have to put in a token number of signatures to get on the national on the presidential ballot, but a third party has to put in like five, ten times the number of signatures. I don't, Art, if you can, do you know what I'm talking about there? Yeah, it's twenty-five thousand. We have to come up with twenty-five, but we're a third party. Minimum. Yeah. Minimum. Because because some because they challenge them. Right, and so you always you say thirty to thirty-five thousand. And we just don't have the resources to mount a twenty-five thousand dollar or twenty-five signature petition drive. So we sent in one drive, and if you're not challenged, you get on the ballot even with one signature. But the Green Party challenged us. And that's one reason I'm probably that was one of the many things in two thousand and twelve that got me convinced. I guess it's time to join the Socialist Party. I've been a socialist. Working within the Greens, but I was just felt like the Greens you, sir. were moving to the right slightly. I mean, especially in Illinois. There's some Greens who are in Illinois. There are some right wing libertarian Greens that, that get under my skin. I don't know if I answered that question, but I'll. Oh, Travis. Travis had his hand up. Ah. Uh, yeah. What would you say is the difference between the socialists? And the communists. Ah, well, um, true story. Um, when the Bolsheviks came to power through their revolution in Russia, they created this thing called the Communist International. And they wanted all of the socialist parties of the world to join it, particularly those that were dedicated to Marxism and Leninism, which was a new ideology that had come out of that revolution. And the Socialist Party actually filled out the paperwork to say, okay, if you'll accept us on these terms, and we spelled out what our terms were, we'll, we'll be a member of your party, of your international. Well, they rejected us because we weren't central planning or, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we didn't get accepted into the Communist International. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Reds, um, the, Socialist Par the Communist Party of the USA was actually a group that broke away from the Socialist Party because they were following the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, one, we, you know, we're, we're, and now that's, that's just, what's the differences today? The Communist Party hasn't run a presidential candidate probably since Gus Hall and Angela Davis in the 70s. So they, they don't believe in running in elections anymore. Um, their ideology is still Stalin, well, Marxist-Lenin is, although they claim that they rejected Stalin along with all of the communist parties when Khrushchev came to power. Um, I, don't, I don't know that if there's a, because communism and socialism have always been interrelated, going back to before Karl Marx. And um, we, we are democratic, whereas most communist parties, at least how they operated while they were in power, they were not democratic. There was a one party rule. The, Democrat, the Socialist Party USA has never supported the idea of one party rule. Um, now the Communist Party USA today may not support the idea of one party rule, but when they were in power they did. Um, personally, I have no problem with many of the Communist Party people that I know, but they're but their politics are really Democrat. They really say, oh, support Barack Obama. He's the working people's candidate. Not really. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> All right. Ileana? Uh, excuse me, I'm from... Yes. Wow, Stand please. Stand up and speak. <laughs> excuse me, I'm from former Soviet Union. OK. I have a question just for... I would like to know your opinion. Uh, back to the 60s and 70s, yeah. when I was in the Soviet Union, like little girl, I was small. So Carter was here president. I would like to know your opinion. What do you think about Carter? Was he really good president? Like he was Democrat, right? Jimmy Carter. Yeah, yeah, okay. Jimmy Carter. Because when we came here, it already was between Reagan and um, so. So I would like to know your opinion. How it really was Democrats still uh, and what Carter was president? <laughs> okay. Um, I I was a, I was a kid in the 70s when Carter came into office. I wasn't a socialist at that point in my life. Um, at that point, I would have said I didn't think capitalism was a good economic system, but I didn't identify as I was a kid, so I was only barely thinking about these things. Um, 
Carter, my understanding was something of a moderate compared to even LBJ or uh, McGovern. McGovern was probably to the left of Carter. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything sure. terribly notable about the Carter administration. It was, it was a fairly short four-year term. He, he talked a lot about human rights. And I, well, no. he didn't do a lot of cuts, but he did start cutting the welfare state, even under him, his sort of cutting social programs, small cuts during Carter's administration, which became big cuts under Reagan. Um, one of the worst things, I, and this, this may get me in trouble with even some of my Democratic Party friends, I think that Carter's decision to send troops secretly into Afghanistan is one of the big reasons why we're stuck in Afghanistan now. I think his destabilization of the regime in Afghanistan was the beginning of a lot of our problems we have today with the Mujahideen and the far-right Islamic terrorists. So I think that was a bad decision on his part. <laughs> so Supporting the Shah was a bad decision. Supporting the Shah was a bad decision, which gave us the whole right... Because there, there was actually a very active Marxist and communist and socialist left in Iran that supported the ouster of the Shah, but as soon as the Muslims got in, the, the far-right Muslims got in power, they exterminated most of those parties. But it was no inflation by this time when Carter was? No, no the inflation wasn't. actually began yeah. under Carter. Reagan. Well, Carter. under Carter, it really began under Carter, and that's why he lost, because yeah, inflation Johnson. went crazy. 15 percent. Yeah. Inflation, 20 percent interest yeah. rates. It was, it was, yeah. it was a... The malaise. Yeah. yeah, but that was, again, that was related, in my opinion, if you don't mind, to the, the I talked about the, the flat wages for 40 years. That started during Carter. This, well, actually, before Carter, but that, that was what, because the corporations couldn't make a profit with the current level of wages. So they started attacking unions to drive wages yeah, down, and that stuff kicked stuff off. So it's all it's all tied together. Well, I'm not an economist either. <laughs> the uh, difference between the socialists and the communists, uh, both parties have a Marxist background. Right. Uh, but uh, though there are plenty of non-Marxist uh, socialists. Right. Um, I consider myself one. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Bolsheviki, other, rather than the Mensheviki, the minority, uh, and some socialist, Russian socialist convention, I think held in London. <laughs> uh, the Bolsheviki emphasized the party to lead. Right. The uh, Social Democrats or the Socialists uh, saw the working class to be uh, and, and the, the party as one organ of the working class. Uh, how would you characterize that? Um, well, I, how I, would the Socialist Party characterize Right, how would the Socialist Party characterize that? And again, I'm relatively new to the Socialist Party, but I've been studying the far left, or <laughs> and the not so far left, since uh, the end of high school, early college years. Um, the, I agree with you about the Vanguard Party, which was a Leninist idea, and um, the idea that, well, the workers, because they're pressed down under capitalism and divided and divided against themselves, that they need a party to step in and lead them. I think that's, that's a half-truth. You do need a socialist party to help the, the, the working class come to power, but it's not a matter of substituting the party's agenda for the working people's agenda, which is what I think they got into. In, I mean, and that's an abstraction at, a, at one level, but by the time... Um, definitely by the time Stalin took over after Lenin's death, you know, and, and even before that, you could think of some of the things that Trotsky and Lenin did prior to Stalin's death as sort of cutting the feet out and not giving the workers any power within a country that was ostensibly a socialist country. So workers' power from below is one of our essential differences between the communists. All right. Yes, uh, Margaret Aguilar. Um, could you um, spe specifically 
say, uh, because you described yourself as a feminist party, yes. could you specifically uh, delineate the current issues you see as feminist issues and okay. how, you, how your party is going to deal with those or how okay. you see it? Yeah. So, um, and it's pretty, it's pretty clear that we are a pro-choice party. There may be some... We have, we have a religious socialist contention with our party that might not be comfortable with abortion, but we are pro-choice. Um, we, and what we, one of the things that, and I, I, again, we have this thing here about women's uh, liberation, and I'll just read a little bit. We work against the exploitation and oppression of women who live with lower wages, fair working conditions of subordination in the home, in society, and in politics. We stand for the right of women to choose safe legal abortion. We believe in women's independent organizations and caucuses. Women will define their own um, liberation. Um, the party, we, uh, let's see, the party actually has a co-chair which are male and female. Um, that's, that's built in. We're not the only social organization to do that, but we're, we agree with social organizations that adopt that. We have, and we have a women's Caucus, um, I've been, I've been, I went through a couple of different socialist groups that I would go to their meetings, find out what they were about before I settled on the socialist party. And I will say that, and again, my experience is limited with the socialist party, but it does seem that women's voices are more prominent. Um, and what, you know, I think that, you know, I don't know if I can come up with issues off the top of my head. We are definitely for reproductive freedom. We are opposed to sexual harassment. We are opposed to wages, wage differentials for the same work. Women work in the same jobs, they should get the same pay. Um, and, and we believe in women in leadership, that it shouldn't just be all men running both the economy and a party or the government. We believe more women should be uh, in government. So. I hope that answer at least gets, gets to the answer. Yep. Is there something specific you had in mind in the question? Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> Getting back to the question about the difference between the communist, socialist differences. Yeah. What's the what's the line of demarcation as far as private ownership of property, mm -hmm. uh, freedom of religion? Right. Is there, is there, I think there's yeah. some fundamental differences there. Absolutely. Um, this this is one of the things they talk about cultural freedom here, and I will say it, it's funny because, of course, the Communist Party in Russia has a reputation for being very belligerent in attacking religion. Bear in mind that they had the Orthodox Church, which was in bed with the czars, <laughs> so you can kind of understand. We don't have a national church in the U.S., so they didn't. We didn't face that problem here in the U.S. with what to do about a state church like they had in Russia. Um, we, uh, the Socialist Party does and has had for a long time a religion commission. I'm actually the um, chair, I'm acting temporary chair of the, so the religion commission. My background is I was raised Pentecostal, I'm a preacher's kid, and um, I, I would advocate for whatever your religion, if you're a Buddhist, a Christian, a Jew, Hindu, um, whatever. And you, and you can see that socialism comes for you out of your religious principles, all power to you. And I believe, you know, there should be, a, there should be Christians stating why they're Christian socialism. There should be Jews stating Jewish socialism. Now, this is my opinion, not necessarily the official opinion okay. of the party. But we have had a religion and ethics commission for many years. Um, we're not the only one. Actually, this Communist Party now has a religion commission. And there are actually some fairly prominent ministers who are Communist Party members. So it's not like things have changed. Back in the old days, what it was like under Stalin and Lenin are not how it's like anymore in Communist parties themselves. Um, but I believe, I mean, we, you know, I believe that religion, religious people, and I can speak from my experience as a former Christian, I became a socialist because of the Bible. So I certainly believe a Christian can become a socialist or even a communist, like I call myself. So I don't think religion is a barrier. Um, some people are uncomfortable in the Socialist Party, especially the more humanist or atheist, with overt expressions of religious support for socialism. 
you know, I, I, I'm not uncomfortable with it, but that's because I'm religious background myself. I'm actually a practicing Quaker today, um, and we're non creedal so we don't oppose our religion. Um, there was, you had another part. You mentioned religion. Private ownership. Of Private ownership. Okay. So, I but don't there's nothing getting back to religion. There's not, nothing in doctrine to suppress religion in the socialist No, party. there's not. Not in the socialist party um, platform. And again, we have a religion commission that its goal is to encourage religious participation in our party. Um, on the private property question, a distinction that is often drawn, and this is, this is only because we don't have a lot of time, there's a distinction between personal property and private property. Very, I don't even think the Communist Party ever said, you have to call it our pen. It's your pen, whatever. But our power company, the power company should be collectively run by the people. In fact, the United States had public utilities until a few decades ago, and they started selling them off at the private interest. So um, there's another phrase that's used a lot, the commanding heights of the economy or industry. This is an early socialist slogan. We nationalize the really big stuff because we're trying to control this problem of not enough jobs, not high enough wages, uh, as well as now we have, since the, the environmental era of the uh, 70s, we, we also realized that industry is destroying the planet. So we want to manage those industries, especially fossil fuels, that are destroying, that are contributing to the destruction of the planet. Um, so private property or personal property, definitely. You have to you have to have a right to your own pen and your own clothes and whatever. But your own house, your own, your own condo. Your, well, your own house. I mean, I've never owned a home, so I don't even know what that's like. And I've, I've always lived in apartments. I'd rather live in a socialistic commune, and I have. I've actually lived with a commune for about nine years, and I love it. And I would go back if, if I didn't. My religion hadn't changed. But anyway, that's another piece of. But my as history. far as doctrine, there's nothing. As far as ever. doctrine of the party, um, we recognize that individual livelihoods, and we believe in a high standard of living, commensurate with, of course, not destroying the planet. Um, so we're not trying to push everybody into poverty. Um, and we're not trying to deprive you of your private possessions. It's really more about the higher levels of the commanding heights of the economy. Okay. Uh, L.P. Anderson. Yes. Hi. Um, do you have any suggestions of uh, what would be uh, your solution to address the welfare problem in the United States, where we have a welfare for billionaires program right. going on? where we're shoveling up your rich people in numbers that haven't been seen in thousands of years. Right. How would you address that? What would you do about it? Well, it'd stop it, but <laughs> that's easy to say. Yeah. That's easy to say. Yeah. Um, well, again, it, we're, this has got to be done democratically. It's got to be done with assemblies of people. So me speaking as an individual, I'm not an economist. Um, I, I, I believe in socialism, and I believe in working people together, deciding okay, this business doesn't need this subsidy anymore. Um, I mean, agricultural subsidies is something, you know, how much the corn industry gets in this country is, is obscene. And, and now we've got, you know, this is, this is diet, but most of you have high fructose corn syrup in your soda in that company because the corn industry gets you subsidies. Those subsidies are, are bad for the economy, bad for the environment. So we need to reduce most of those subsidies. I can say, I, I don't know, Again, the problem here is that we're in a situation where the working people don't have an institutional voice because the unions have been, you know, whittled down to virtually nothing. Um, I would want to strengthen the union movement, get, get unions back in. One of the, my favorite pieces of legislation that got defeated was the Employee Free Choice Act because that would have given everybody at every workplace the right to join a union more or less instantly. And that was, you know, Reg uh, sorry, Obama said he was going to put that forward, and then he backed off, and it, it didn't go anywhere. Um, but again, I think as long as you've got millionaires yeah. and billionaires, well, more millionaires, in Congress, getting dependent on billionaires and trillionaires to keep winning their campaigns, you're not going to you're not going to change the situation of these subsidies that are ridiculous. Um, and so, I again, to me, a workers' movement from below is got to be a, a part to sort of destabilize the, the influence that the rich have over our politics and our economy. All right. Uh, 
Dan? All right. Um, <clears throat> you say socialists don't pollute or don't want to pollute ever. Like I didn't United say States. that. You didn't but say go that? Go ahead. All right. Uh, well, in a perfect world where socialists are, what about China? I mean, they pollute the worst, and they're a communist country. Right. Okay. Well, um, there's a history to that. Of course, I know more about history than I know about uh, economics. Um, the early socialists, going back before Lenin, were industrialists. They believed in industrial economy. They believed that in industry, sort of like they, would, they, they believed that industry was going to eliminate human want and need. And actually it has, in my opinion, at least potentially. Because of the profit motive, we don't eliminate human want and need, but we could. We just simply gave everybody a job and cut their hours and increased their wages, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and eliminate corporate profits. Um, destroying the environment, of course, we know that the Soviet Union, and particularly Chernobyl, comes to mind. They were horrible. China is doing the same thing. I, um, and, and again, those are communist parties. The Socialist Party would, I would hope, would do different where we in power, but we haven't been in power. Um, I, I, uh, we're, we're, I believe that one of the, and it is in our statement of principles that we are for ecological harmony. Uh, this is something new to the socialist movement, though it only really became a widespread principle in the, in the 70s. Um, prior to that, a lot of people weren't thinking scientifically about the environmental problems. And then it, and then it sort of got noticed. And that's why you had the Green Party, because all of a sudden it was realized this was a major political issue. Um, I, I don't think... <laughs> I don't think there's a... I, so... I would say there, there is a movement called the eco-socialist movement, which has tried to work on sort of the problems of socialism and ecology. Um, and, you know, again, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I believe that the socialist movement that I know today, not the socialist movement of the first half of the 20th century, is environmentally aware and sensitive. Just like most liberals are environmentally aware and sen sen sensitive today. So, not that we're ahead of the curve, but I believe that capitalism and, and, and heavy industry is what's driving a lot of these crises of the environment. So, and socialists have always been about controlling those for human need rather than for profit and greed. All right, David Zucker. Yes. Now you say you're a practicing Quaker. Yes. So since you are, how come you don't use the V and the thou? Well, most practicing Quakers do. <laughs> there is the conservative, old-fashioned conservative Quakers do. They're, they're great people, but they're not most Quakers. They're actually a very small minority of Quakers. Also, you're not wearing gray. <laughs> no, but I do have a peace sign on my T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, yeah, um, the gentleman asked a question about China. Yes. Wouldn't you agree that the Socialist Party's view of China is that it's communist in name only? That yeah. China is nothing more than a strictly controlled capitalist country where all the wealth that used to be spread among the Chinese population is now being accumulated in the big cities. You've got, you know, a middle class and an upper class Chinese caste. We don't view that as a socialist country. Not even close. Right. And, and I mean, there's even questions of the degree to which Mao himself really was a socialist and wasn't more of sort of a peasant revolutionary who aligned with certain elements of the working and middle classes to create a revolution. Um, so, workers' control has never, even on the scale in the early Soviet Union that they had right after the 1917 revolution, where they had workers' Soviets all over the country that would have been formed in the preceding period, they were eventually shut down by Lenin and Trotsky, uh, who were supposedly for workers' power. China never even had that. They never even had workers' Soviets on the scale that early, the early Russian Revolution did. So I don't, I don't think they were ever really socialist from the bottom up like the Socialist Party has always advocated. They're definitely a stratified class society. Bureaucratic, there's lots of names. Bureaucratic capitalism, um, state capitalism, deformed worker states. You know, China's problematic in the history of capital, communist and socialist politics because they, they sort of blended 
a lot of incompatible things together. It's sort of like the United States does, but anyway. <laughs> All right, David. I had my question. Oh. Yeah, right. he had the one question about the, <laughs> the Quakers. <laughs> yeah, another question about yeah. the uh, Quakers. Uh, most Quakers, of course, there's Quakers. Nixon. He was a hypocrite. <laughs> but I mean, most Quakers believe in pacifism right. or some form of that. So, would you explain again? The, the Socialist you, Party sir. and you. how right. you talk about war and mm -hmm. peace and right. imperialism and like that. Right. Now I'm going to look at the... Because so I'm trying to represent the party, minutes. not necessarily my individual view. Here we go. International Solidarity and Peace. This is, a, this is from our official statement of principles. People around the world have more in common with each other than their rulers. So we right away, the ruling class and the people are different. We condemn war, preparation for war, and the militaristic culture because they play havoc with people's lives, divert resources from constructive social projects. Militarism also concentrates even greater power in the hands of the few, the powerful, and the violent. We align with no nation, but only with working people around the world. That's our statement of principle. We're not strictly speaking pacifists, although there are many well-known pacifists have been in the Socialist Party. David McReynolds, you may have heard of him, who um, the War Resistance League that Charlie uh, Paddock was talking about. He was their national secretary for years and years. I mean, he's been a Socialist Party presidential candidate. <laughs> so we have a pacifist strain within our party. We're not uniformly pacifist. Thank you. Martin Key. Ron Basford. <laughs> <laughs> if the Socialist Party won a local election, what change would we won the election to be sure, governor. <laughs> we won to be governor. Well, the Greens couldn't pull that off, although they came closer than anybody else. Rich Whitney's campaigns were actually um, the, 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 what what we would do. I mean, I, I assume winning the election in in the in Illinois would mean that there was a widespread socialist movement across the country, across the state, across the state. And so, if I were a socialist governor, let me role play here a minute, I would mobilize all the locals that had gotten me elected and say, okay, you guys need to get people in your in your local offices who favor socialism. And of course, legislation that comes across my desk, I would, you know, evaluate it from a working class, you know, ecological and, in, and you know, socialist feminist principles and probably veto everything. <laughs> but, but anyway, <laughs> you know, I mean... Uh, you do such things as declare a 30-hour work I would say I would say that that should be on the, the agenda. We definitely should look at a 30-hour work week. I, I believe in a 30-hour work week for 20 years. Well, I mean, do you take into account the economic realities that the other people who are working 40-hour work weeks are going to kick your ass? Well, I understand, and, and I agree with that. That's why I would say if we reduce hourly wage, our hours work, we've also got to increase wages. So, and, and the problem is, is that the, is that the, the ruling, the capitalists, corporate classes that are making these huge obscene profits need to shovel those profits back to the working people. And we need some mechanism to do that. I think something more along the lines of a guaranteed income or an income supplement or reverse income tax, something to that effect. You know, one thing, I'd reinstitute, reinstitute very progressive taxation. That would be one thing. And again, I hope I never have to make the decision, but... I there. <laughs> Do you think that the uh, lack of a parliamentarian system in U.S. government is inhibiting the advance of third parties? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question I've looked into. Um, I'm actually a political science major, um, and I've studied comparative democracy. And I definitely land in those countries. So, you know, it, it's an interplay. Let's see, uh, Rosalie Regal. Why, why is the Socialist Party's attitude towards the outside sourcing of jobs that started under Clinton, was DAFTA and CAFTA, how, what, what is their plan for getting these jobs back so there will be some workers? Um, we're in an interesting, and I, the, 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 immediately what comes to mind is protectionism, which is a failed policy, the idea of trying to keep jobs here through NAFTA, well, not through NAFTA, but prior to NAFTA. Um, again, I think I think a lot of the old answers from the early 20th century socialist movement about how to make a thriving economy don't work because we're not in a boom economy, globally speaking. 
Um, so I, I don't know if I can give you a satisfying answer because I can't think of one on the, off of the, off of, while I'm standing on my feet. But I, I, again, I, I believe in things like reducing the work week and increasing wages and increasing unions and nationalizing the number of industries to sort of begin this process of changing the balance of economic forces in the country. And I, you know, I, I would, I believe we need more jobs in this country, but I actually believe almost more than that, we just need to, re, we need to change what jobs are out there and, and increase some things. You know, I'm afraid I don't have an answer that easily rolls off the top of my head. I just, I just think we need to change the economy in general and that will solve that, the problems of, of too many jobs going elsewhere. Right. Ayala, what would you do about separation of church and state? And would you continue the tax exemptions to churches and religious institutions? That's a good question. I, I, I can't speak for the party on that. Um, Why? You avoid it? Um, because I am, I don't know that particular, I don't even think that appears in any of our principles as something we've discussed. We have atheists and secular and humanist members as well as religious members. Um, tax exemption for churches, and this is speaking personally, um, there's, a, there's a lot of abuse of that. Um, there's also reasons why churches are non-profit. What we don't, reasons? We don't, huh? What reasons? What? There's no reasons. You said there are some reasons. There is no reason. What? That the churches are exempt from paying their fair taxes and... The reasons are they're non-profit. That's what I, I don't know what you heard me say. The reason we don't tax churches, actually there's, I don't know enough about where that comes from, the tax exemption. I'm not paying close attention to the history of it. They get many more tax exemptions than the non profits They do, and I agree. That and I would say they should probably to get to the level of non-profit tax exemption rather than this blanket, oh, you can have all the property and you can put your cardinal up in a mansion and it's non-profit, you know, non-taxable. That, I have a problem with all that. What, what in the end, how you would tax a, a religious organization at a non-profit level, I would say that would be my starting point. But I, you know, I, I can't give you a on I think they should be taxed, but not maybe, not as a for-profit corporation. Okay, Charles? Yeah, is there, under eco-socialism, does the government seize control over all forested land, coal mines, other things like that? Again, the, the, I believe in bottom up, from the bottom, and and we should definitely have policies that are nationwide about the fair, well, not fair, that's, ooh, sorry, about proper use of natural resources. We want to protect the forests that we still have left, um, and we want to prevent, you know, uh, the, you know, when I think of climate change, for example, one of the big things we want to do is fewer cars, so we want to have smarter vehicles, we want mass transportation. I think the mass transportation system needs to be boosted. We need more of that so that we use less fossil fuels. Um, the and, and definitely protect the existing forests, and we don't want to, you know, definitely eco-socialists are trying to learn from the environmentalist movement. I don't think the environmentalist movement has all the answers to this, but we definitely should use or relate to the natural order, the non-human world, in a constructive rather than a destructive manner. And that's kind of abstract in, in general. Um, I, I, I just think some of these things are going to be decided or will, will have to be decided democratically on a local or national or state basis. And I'm sorry, I'm not totally prepared for the question. But. All right. Uh, Dale and then Dan. Yeah. Um, a two-part question. What uh, position would the Socialist Party take regarding nuclear power generation, nuclear weapons, and uh, the insoluble problem of what to do with the garbage 
that they create. Right. And the corresponding part in part is what would be the position on changing the legal definition of a corporation so that it can escape, operate without uh, social and, uh, uh, and economic responsibility towards the people that they affect. The corporations are people too, aren't they? <laughs> Criminal. Criminal, yes. Um, so I would definitely agree that we want to strip corporate personhood, and I mean that's ridiculous. Um, and on the here's here actually it's in our principles. The cleanup of the contaminated environment and the creation of a nuclear-free world are among the first tasks of a socialist society. All right. They've already come to that. So <laughs> yeah. there you go. That's their answer, and and I support it. All right, uh, Dan. Okay. Uh, Socialist Party, uh, Social Security, mm -hmm. and Public Libraries, they're kind of like socialists. Would the Socialist Party continue Social Security and Public Libraries? We definitely want to take care of people after they've worked a productive couple of whatever in fact is. Again, I believe in shorter work weeks and even shorter career spans. Um, I believe in guaranteed incomes. Um, and public libraries, I definitely affect, I mean, to me, what the Chicago has been doing with its public libraries, when they cut their hours and all that, I don't like that. So I'm, I'm in favor of making information as free as possible. And I don't know what more I can say than that. Uh, David? Uh, yes. All right. Yes. Um, if a socialist president took office, what would the socialist party's position be on continuing support for Israel? Wow. All right. Um, Y'all don't need to ask easy questions. What's wrong with you? Um, it's me. All right. I don't know if we have an official statement. You do. You do. Just look. So can, people, can I? Can I yield the floor? Just so people know, we have a platform. That's the statement of principles. Right. We have a national platform that we draft at every convention, and it usually addresses most of the large issues. We don't address minutia issues like, how are you going to fix my sidewalk when you reach power? Well, you know, who knows? Maybe we will, it will be grass, no sidewalk. But I mean, as far as Israel, the Middle East, I think our official position, if I can remember, is that there should be neither a state of Israel or a state of Palestine, that there should be a socialist federation of the Middle East including all the peoples that live there, sharing the economic resources, not just Saudi Arabia getting the oil, but everybody's sharing from the oil. This That's, is, this is the so but it's on our website. This is the so-called binational solution, which, I, which I'm glad to hear that the party's on record, because that's been my position, the binational solution. That is, you create a secular Israel, or secular greater Palestine. Uh, uh, Rick Daniels? Uh, right here. Oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm Rick. You're Rick. Where is Tony? Scarlata. Yes. Tony Scarlata. I do. Um, how would your party promote uh, workers' co-ops? We believe in them, definitely. Um, they're, it's funny, because if you want to talk to Socialist Party members, if you have Facebook, we have the Socialist Network page that is our party-sponsored discussion forum. Recently, the question came up about co-ops. And everybody, the, everybody chimed in, yes, co-ops are great, co-ops are great. You know, of course, we also believe in some level of you know, national coordination of the economy, but basically, we, we would love to replace corporations with co-ops. I don't know how fast we can do that, but I think we would agree that co-ops are an important element, just like a union is an important element in the new economy, whatever that looks like. Uh, let's see, Victor and then Miguel. Uh, I wonder if you will address uh, louder, please. I want to hear. I wonder if you will address uh, unjust, ungodly injustice that's been perpetrated on uh, the American uh, native inhabitants, and we will return some of the land back to them. Right. I have. I don't know that. I, he asked a question about Native American rights, Native peoples, not necessarily Native Americans. They were peoples before there was an America. Native peoples' rights. And I definitely agree that 
we should do everything we can to redress those those imbalances. I don't know that there's an official socialist party, but there may be somewhere. <laughs> Again, I, I turn to Art, who's really the, the expert on the party. Um, but definitely I support, as a socialist, um, the self-determination of those communities. They can create their own culture, their own economies, but they should be socialist economies. So, um, <laughs> so that, you know, there you go. Um, but a social economy is a full employment economy. What they've got on those reservations, those who live on, most of them don't live on reservations, but those who do, those are not fully full employment economies either. So, um, yeah, I definitely, I don't know whether we should break up the United States into multiple regions. Some people believe that, and those should be closer. Yeah. We've got so many federal lands, parks, uh, yeah. organic, so, yeah. you know, we could give them back some of we can, we can definitely, I mean, all that's, to me, all that is discussable issues. It's not discussable yeah. under the present United States, where... It's all one United States with maybe a few little reservations that are theoretically independent nations, and they're not. You know, um, we definitely can improve that situation, and I uh, think socialism would be in favor. Uh, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Right. Uh, yes, uh, Miguel. So, uh, well, I just joined last month, and I have a question regarding uh, membership as well as your political strategy. Yeah. Of the Socialist Party. Because it seems that I know, especially in Chicago, there is a very small group, a uh, very small uh, amount of members. There is a small amount of members in the yes. branch of the Socialist Party. And I was wondering, um, just over 20 dues-paying members, according to Art. I was wondering what uh, is the party doing in regards of full-stream numbers in the group as well as um, public service, uh, in regards to public service announcements, uh, rallies, uh, and also um, recruitment of the youth. Right. Well, in terms of recruitment efforts, you're looking at it. This is the beginning, hopefully, of more recruitment. Um, most people find out about the Socialist Party through the internet these days, and I would like to see um, that inc increased, because um, that's where the youth are. The youth are on the web. Um, and I definitely would like to see socialist contingents at all the major demonstrations, uh, socialist party contingents, because there are socialist contingents. You've got these big organizations that I referenced earlier that are bigger than us, but they don't have a lot of the unique combination of socialist principles that we have because they tend to be Leninist, most of these other social organizations. Or Trotskyists. Well, Trotskyists are Leninist in my theory, but I know, I know what you're saying. <laughs> we won't start that. We won't start what is a Leninist versus a Trotskyist. Um, but they're either, they're Leninist meaning they could be Maoist, they could be Trotskyists, they could be, they're not, they're democratic centralists generally, not internal democratic organizations like we are. Um, I would like to see us boost our efforts, but when we're starting with just over 20 dues-paying members in the whole Chicago metropolitan area, state of Illinois, we probably don't have much more than that in the whole state. We're starting from ground zero. The party went through some tough times in the, I don't know, the early, the first decade of the 20th century or even further back, but we're rebuilding. That's why All this our is, times have been tough. Well, right, but that's why we're rebuilding. We call this rebuilding because we need to rebuild. We need to get our message out. I'm one of the people willing to stand up here and at, answer embarrassing questions. I don't have all the answers, but I can point you to people who do. Um, and I do want to do more recruitment efforts. And if you're willing, you said you are a member of the Socialist Party in Chicago. Yes. We're going to have a meeting. We, we, Art and I were talking about having a meeting in April or May. Conrad's also, well, I don't want to out all the members, but there are other members in the room. Um, <laughs> we we want to have more local meetings. We've had since I joined. We've had this. We've had two or three, and we need to have more. But it's hard to get when you've only got 20 plus names to draw from. It's hard to pull off a local meeting. So we do want to do more. And if you, and and I'm hoping that maybe a few more people will sign up tonight and help us rebuild the party. That's really what motivated me to do this and to offer this to Charlie Paydock. All right. All right, Charlie. Yeah, there, do you think we should nationalize and socialize the arts and humanities? I definitely believe that 
arts and humanities need to have, need not be dependent on profit. You know, I mean, we had the, the National Endowment for the Arts, which, you know, was attacked viciously by Reagan and ever since. I definitely believe that the arts need support that's not profit-based. So, nationalizing, I don't know, but definitely local artists, artists who don't have a lot of money but are really, you know, they should, we should definitely have some sort of system of support for the arts publicly. Oh, no, no. Rick. Rick, that's fine. So, I'm getting to understand this now. So, defining it, I guess, the Socialist Party would be, you've conceded that individual property ownership is okay, right. according to the Socialist Party, that you're only looking to nationalize, I guess the word is, of major distribution and industries. There would be private enterprise, like... Lincoln Restaurant would be private. So there's going to be disparity as far as wealth. I'm assuming the, the Socialist Party would be in favor of a progressive tax as right. opposed to a uniform tax. or right. Flat tax. And as far as interventionist, uh, would be non-interventionist, a, a great decrease in military spending. So the Israel question would be answered there. Right, that's own. part of it, yep. And so, um, thank you. I think I'm starting to get the picture. Okay. Um, the only thing I want to put in into what you said, because I thank you. You helped me. That was what I was hoping that somebody would kind of get all that out of what I had. And to freedom say. of religion. Freedom that, of religion, that. definitely freedom of religion. Um, the, um, the thing I would say there was something I wanted to, to say in response to your sort of a, try to summarize everything. Um, and I lost it. Um, maybe, it'll come, maybe it'll come back. Maybe it'll come back. Right. Sounds good, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Sign up. I have, I have a couple of membership forms right here, and we can get more. And I, w I actually will have a sign-up sheet. It's over here somewhere. That if you want to, if you want to sign up for, and I'll give this to Art, who's our party. Uh, I don't know what to call you. you. You say you don't officially have a title, but he is the party contact in the Chicago area. So if you want to mm -hmm. sign up, name, phone number, email, and snail mail address, we'd love it if you want to sign up. Yeah. Well, uh, Bill? Would, yeah. Would the uh, party support a um, change in the banking system? Definitely. E either yeah. the uh, destruction of the mega banks, uh, forcing them to be regional and local, and uh, would it... Uh, National promote the idea of a national bank that would offer competition to the private banking system if they couldn't meet the people's needs. Definitely. We need to change how the banking system works in this country. Um, well, you wouldn't have a, a, a private bank. You'd have huh? you, the party would prefer to have national They would banks. probably prefer national or at least state, state banks. banks. There, there was actually was a discussion on the Socialist Party members list about Idaho is it, no Nebraska or, or South Dakota. One of those Western North states that actually Dakota. has a state bank. North Dakota. North Dakota has a state bank, and their economy is doing better than the most many other economies because of that state bank, because it doesn't, you know, it engage in the same kind of they're not held favoritism. By Wall they're not right. They're not the favoritism to the corporations. They just they can resist it. So that's a that's something I think should be spread across the whole country. Excuse me. Yes, sir. I believe no, that's I, Minnesota. I'm not excusing. I believe that's <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> no, it's a state. No, 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 North Dakota. No, no, I believe it's no, North Dakota, too. North Dakota. Too. North Dakota. We were, like I said, we just had a discussion about this on our members list. list. If I may interject, North, uh, Wisconsin has state life insurance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Who wants to see. live there? Uh, Jesse. Jess. Yes. You have a question. Yeah, so one comment and one question. The comment about the banks, they, the banks are preferential, but they're set up to be preferential for state businesses, or for businesses that are going to bring jobs to the states, right. they're going to improve the economies of that state. So that it's not a fair system, it's a maybe a more just system, but it's not. So that it is, it is, sus, it is subject social. To, to pressures. Those pressures are to improve the economy of that state. Right. That's so my, my comment on the state bank. Yeah. My, my question is, does the 
Does the party's platform speak specifically to to repurposing land that isn't that isn't being most effectively used, like a a NASCAR racetrack? Is that the best use for land? Ah. <laughs> I don't think we have the, the Soldier Field the best use of uh, scarce resources. Right, and, and a cemetery. It's interesting. I, I mean, these things come up, and I think these are open questions for what would it, if we had a workers. Democ democracy in the city of Chicago, we could decide, is Soldier Field, does it deserve, does Wrigley Field, you know, we can look at that. I don't, I don't know that those are big economic questions that socialism addresses. Um, I, you know, but, and those, but those two examples might have been misleading. I'm thinking yeah. of like strip malls. Are strip malls the best use of land? Right. So I'm, I'm thinking at a national level, does the party's platform address, say, disqualifying certain enterprises from access to land because they provide little to no benefit to society? Well, well, but I mean, there are, again, we're not we're not a central planning generally. So it's we from, have, from the bottom up. Yeah, we tend to our our work from the bottom up. At least we believe in that. So you want to have an active socialist party, an active worker, you want to have active local economic councils where everybody can get in and chip in on these kind of decisions. So, you know, lo local cities will rule out strip malls, and they do do that in some parts of the U.S. even. You can't have a strip mall here. So there's no reason why that couldn't become a widespread phenomenon if we have local democratic control of the economy. Why would the party care? As long as you're, as long as you're well, in charge of the means of production and distribution, what happens at a strip mall isn't the party's concern? Well, and, and I, I'm just trying to sort of answer question. I again, I think this is going to be a local question. Do we want to, you know, like a like a like I live in the city. I live in Evanston. I just moved there. I used to live there a long time ago. I'm back in Evanston, and there's a public hearing on a sign. Somebody, some apartment complex wants to put up a new sign, and they're having a public hearing on that. So. You know, that de democratic control over how your economics, I think that is just part of democracy. Yeah, it's not a big question. Why would we really care whether it's strip mall or not? I can think of reasons why I may not want a strip mall, although there is one just four blocks away from me. Yeah, I, don't I guess know the, question, the question is, how intrusive is the party once it gets past its stated doctrine? If the doctrine is the major means of production and distribution, then what happens locally should not be the concern of the party. If the party is going to be successful, it better have that policy. Well, but, but we might want have if a it's party, 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 part of a party that no, no, I understand. Local I understand, and that's what we're saying. The national party doesn't dictate Rosalie, policy to the locals. Rosalie, did you have a question? I thought you were waving your hand a little no, while ago. I'm just waving my hand. Oh, <laughs> oh well, that's very friendly. Okay. Uh, in that case, perhaps we should move to rebuttals. Yes. Uh, how many have uh, remarks to make to the rest of us? Yes, I'll time Brahm. I, I got the ever faithful stopwatch built into the cell phone, so we're good to go. Wait a minute. We had a clarification. He says rebuttals means you don't have to refute the speaker. <laughs> all right, let's get going on the rebuttals. It is not required. Maybe it should be more like comment period. Well, you want a fresh diet coke? Well, that's a bit fresh of you. Yes. Okay. All right, let's get going. All right. Beginning with who's on live? Joe Meyer first. Rebuttal. Let's get started. We got an open mic. Avanti, avanti. Uh, a few points on the subject of Israel, for example. Uh, of, uh, Israel is officially 
a socialist country. It's a democratic socialist country. Officially, it's, it's, it's history, and that was the uh, the origin of much of its uh, political involvement after the uh, Second World War. Um, in the uh, United States, about five eighths of our workforce is involved in what are what's generally known as white collar work. Those are accountants, McDonald's clerks, and so on and so forth. While only three eighths of our working population are involved in some aspect of uh, manufacturing, maintenance, and so forth. So that that has a direct effect, I believe, on. Uh, the way in which our government moves and the way in which the susceptibility of the working population is to socialism. Um, one of the problems that uh, uh, we see with corporations, we, we, we bunch corporations, big corporations. It takes three people to form a corporation. And uh, there's been a movement both in these small, limited person corporations and even the large corporations now to what is called a limited liability corporation in that the investors are limited in their responsibility or liability to the extent of their investment. So for example, a law firm uh, may invest uh, $100,000 in you know, equipment, office equipment, and so forth. So even if they're sued for $20 million because of malpractice, nonetheless, the principals who form the corporation would be uh, liable only to the extent of their uh, investment. So that, that's pretty tough. And the bigger corporations are moving in that direction right now. Um, a subject that is... Uh, Will, will create a good deal of um, debate, I think, is the rural or the farm economy. Many of the farms that we see in the uh, in Illinois, for example, are individually owned, family-owned uh, corporations. Most of them are corporations. Um, but in fact, you have to raise the question of efficiency uh, from a scientific point of view. Is it better to have individual farms covering large large areas of the state, or would you rather have a, uh, a centralized farm system where the, the uh, machinery could go for miles and miles without stopping in one direction, turn around and come in another direction? It would be much more efficient than the family firms, family farms. And I think that uh, the Socialist Party should deal with something like that. Even though the majority of the population of the United States lives in urban or suburban areas, uh, nonetheless, because of the U.S. Constitution and the distribution of senatorship, uh, it's possible for rural, rural states uh, to have their say. Thank you. Yeah. Today I, I heard uh, Dr. Hansen from uh, NASA and uh, he said, uh, imagine that we see a meteorite coming in toward the Earth and we know that it will be hit in a year or two. And so we keep discussing about what kind of uh, method we are going to use to divert it. And so every day that passes, it becomes harder and more expensive to correct the course of this meteorite. He says the Earth is being hit by a meteorite right now, and we are ignoring it. And the fact is that we are losing our lands, we are, we are uh, raising the seas, uh, we are expecting tremendous disruptions in the way that we can grow food and, uh, and that we can maintain the cities around the coastal areas. And we are doing nothing. So it, to me tonight, uh, this discussion on socialism or, or not, it seems uh, uh, trivial because we still are not confronting the issues that will make a difference to every human being on the earth. 
and the fact is that if we look, we can see already today that these effects and these problems are coming and hitting people everywhere, including here in the United States. Dean um, Hartner. I'd like to thank the speaker. I think it was a very interesting discussion. I think uh, he shows a uh, a good deal of humility, which is something we probably could use more of here at the college. Um, I got a few points. Uh, uh, Things were mentioned about the presidents. I would look at the book, although I don't agree with some of his ratings. Kenneth Davis don't know much about the American presidents. Um, the question of communism and socialism came up, and there was a discussion there. Sometimes this is a weakness of the college of complex. To me, there's one word that could have just summarized everything. Communist, socialist, the difference is democracy. I haven't heard of a, in my opinion anyway, of a communist country that was truly democratic. So I think that one word, there's this de democratic uh, centralism, uh, but to me that's not any kind of true democracy. That was mentioned in the discussion. The main uh, question I've got, and it's really an offshoot of what Fr uh, Frank said from a totally, maybe a different point of view, and that is, uh, I question the, the concept of uh, un uh, constant and, and unending progress. That concept's got to be looked at. There's a book named with, by Morris Berman, Why America Failed. And he criticizes socialism, among others, uh, as uh, buying into the idea, including union, unions, so, uh, capitalism, and socialism all buying in the, the idea of constant and unending progress. And, you know, Frank is saying uh, some, maybe, I'm, I don't want to paraphrase, phrase that, I don't want to uh, critique what Frank said, but, you know, hey, we're always doing more and we're ruining the environment, ru ruining the entire uh, earth by constantly wanting progress. It is it progress when we got more and more poor people and people who are earning more money and 1% earning all this money and all this plastic junk that we've got. Plastic shit. Yeah, right. I remember that phrase. Okay. Anyway, I think it was a great talk and uh, I, I'm considering joining. All right. Yeah. I'm Howard Ford. Um, I admire the enthusiasm that you have and the intellectual curiosity and uh, to develop something that right from scratch. And it, I, I guess it must be pretty exciting, really, to be in that. But on the other hand, I'm really disappointed. I, how, can, how can we in this country think that there are going to be any changes unless there's any unity in the left? Uh, the Green Party lacks a lot, but it has a lot. And some of these other socialist parties do too. How about really having a convention and talk over having a, a united front? This is what happens in other countries. I mean, is it, is it so much in the American brain that we, we have to start a new one? We have to break off? We can't cooperate? We can't work together? We can't form a coalition? I, 
I mean, it just seems incredible to me that we can't do that. By the way, I was on the uh, state board of the Green Party in New York State. I didn't, I haven't been active since I came here, but I think I'm going to again, but I, I'm, I'm really disappointed to, th to see that another splinter is occurring. I mean, uh, as much as you have in contact wonderful things and substance, but you've got to join together. We're, we're never going to get anywhere unless we join together. I, I think it's, I mean, to just talk here about principles, it's, it doesn't seem to be, we've got to talk about strategy, looking at all possible strategies and figuring out the best one. Somewhat similar to what I spoke about a few weeks ago, looking at all options before making major decisions. We've got to look at all the strategies. What is the best things about the Green Party, about the Socialist Party, maybe even some of the independents? Let's bring it together and be unified, or we're, we're going to all die separately. Yeah, uh, our speaker tells us that the, um, the old uh, communists and socialists were very bad, did terrible things, uh, like uh, the under Lenin, Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin and uh, Castro and uh, all of those, I would also call... What about the Tsar? Don't interrupt, one full time. I would also call to your attention that the uh, word Nazi stood for National Socialist German Workers Party. So uh, the old communism and socialism didn't work. So uh, what our speaker says is let's forget about all of that and let's start anew and rebuild the socialist party so we can do it all over again. And what would we have? Communism, socialism has never worked anywhere in the world so that there's no reason on earth that it's going to work. They say that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. The fact is, the truest thing that the speaker said tonight is that socialism is much smaller than it has ever been, that the, the socialist party is much smaller the membership is much smaller, and the reason for that is as we go further into the future, it will continue to get smaller and smaller, yeah. and I look forward to that because in the words of Ronald Reagan, communism should be consigned to the ash heap of history. Yeah. 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 Viva la Reagan Revolucion! And what I want to say is I recommend all of you to look to the truth. Viva capitalism! I recommend that you read Socialism, the Unknown Ideal. I, I'm sorry, Socialism or the Anti-Industrial Revolution by Ayn Rand. Oh. Or that you read, or that you read capitalism, the unknown ideal, because we haven't, we don't have capitalism now, and we have not had real capitalism due to a thing called government interference, government control, and if we had real capitalism, none of this nonsense would be happening. Right. And that's just about everything I have to say. Okay. Get on the timer there. I'm already, Brom. All right.
for several weeks I've been uh, announcing a, a book uh, by Richard Wolf with two F's. Wolf. Uh, it, it's an interview with David Barsamian and it's a, a small book, paper bound, uh, uh, 186 pages. Uh, it's worth reading. It's called Occupy the Economy, uh, Challenging Capitalism. Uh, in this period, when for 40 years, as has been said, uh, the uh, average wage uh, has not increased in this country, and uh, or the buying power of the average wage has not increased. Uh, the, though uh, productivity per uh, person hour of uh, work uh, has increased, I think it's at something like three or four percent a year. Uh, you know, the, uh, you would think that there might be some kind of social profit uh, from the increased productivity. Uh, and where has it gone? Well, we have had a great expansion of credit. Uh, most people are in hock. Uh, have uh, credit card bills that are paying interest at fabulous rates and are losing their houses, uh, losing their uh, jobs, uh, losing, you know, it's a sad, sad picture. And the squeeze is on everybody, from this restaurant uh, to uh, uh, yourself. Uh, and, and there are threats against entitlements, uh, such as Social Security or Medicare, uh, and I hope that you will be joining uh, with the Jane Adams Senior Caucus and the uh, SEIU and others uh, uh, at the uh, uh, April 2nd demonstration. What is it, noon at Federal Plaza? Uh, Federal Plaza, noon, Adams and Dearborn. Yeah, uh, at least we should be uh, demonstrating uh, against uh, cuts in the the, uh, the the network of, of, uh, of support for for human services uh, that are needed in the society, uh, and, and uh, maybe saving your your bottle caps to send to your elected representatives so that they get the picture that a lot of people are for uncapping the amount of wages or salaries uh, that uh, can be taxed for Social Security. Uh, Social Security is not a progressive tax, but you know, it's a regressive tax that only falls on the uh, What's it, about $110,000 of uh, earnings? $113,000. $113,000 today. It's gone up. But it's not equal. And the, the, uh, the, the results of the, what people get for it is uh, pretty equal. Uh, let's see. So, uh, when we had a depression, a real depression in the 30s, uh, there were uh, lots of unemployed. Uh, today, uh, what is it, 7.7% uh, 7 .7 of the, uh, of the workforce that haven't given up looking for work are unemployed. Well, and those who, uh, you know, that's millions and millions of people. Back in the 30s, 
uh, the federal government uh, created jobs, paid people to do things that were in the national interest. And, uh, and we, well, certainly there's plenty to be done. Why isn't the federal government doing it today? Well, nobody's asking them to do it, particularly not the Democratic Party and or the Green Party that I've noticed. Okay? There's call, class war goes on every day and I, I hope that the Socialist Party will be amongst those who will raise the slogans of the class that is being screwed. Well, you know, Charlie, uh, your speech might have been uh, useless because according to some whack jobs in this country, we already live in a socialist country with a socialist president and socialist policies. I don't see it. Uh, you heard here a very ringing denunciation of communism, and I want to second that. You know, I really hate communists, too. Uh, I got relatives in what used to be Czechoslovakia. They lived under communism for 40 years, so I'm no pro-communist. That's why I'm a socialist. And the one thing you should realize is when we say socialist, it comes from a term democratic socialism. That's the, what we believe in. Not just socialism, but democratic socialism. It's a totally, if you look it up on Wikipedia, you'll see that it believes in democracy is the highest uh, principle by which we live. So when somebody says, let's nationalize the industry, well, what about the workers? Are they going to have a say in it? Just because the government owns the means of production, who owns the government? That's the bottom line. That's where a democratic socialist idea is that, oh, we don't want a strip mall, says, says the mayor. Well, maybe the people need a strip mall, and, and they have the right to overrule that government official, or the other way around, you know? So uh, a, having a democratic decision-making power in your everyday life, from, the, from your house, from your block, from your little town to the village to the big cities, you know, do the people of Chicago have the right to talk about which schools they want closed? No. Mayor Rahm says this is going to be closed? And tough crap. The same way Daly said Megsfield, we're closing it. Who cares what you people want? You know. So that's just what I want to say on that. That uh, democratic socialism is not just socialism. It's a different strain. It's not communism. The other thing I wanted to mention, just briefly, a lot of times when we go to things like this, People say, well, okay, how are you going to pay for, somebody asked, uh, the welfare system. How are you going to pay for the Illinois pensions, you know, the workers' pensions that the state cheated them out of by not giving the money to the, to the pensioning? Well, suddenly when those conversations come in a socialist meeting, America is like, Chad, we have no wealth. We're the poorest country in the world. We can't afford to pay teachers. We can't afford to have a social program. But wait a minute, there was one guy who paid over $30 million to Newt Gingrich for his campaign. One man managed to have $30 million. It's not that we don't have the wealth in this country to, to give everybody a good paying job, to have good, good schools in every community, not based on property taxes, but based on general revenue. We have all that money here. The bankers managed to blow billions of dollars, and we bailed them out. And yet bank officials still get $20 million a year as a salary. So there is money in this country to do all the social programs you have and even help the rest of the world. It's how do we allocate this money? Do we let it be drained away? Because you know the middle class is dying in this country. Pretty soon it'll be like Mexico. A few rich people and then everybody is, is the peasant. And that's what the, well, that's what the powers that be in this country want to see. Now, as far as capitalism, this was just on the news today, and I thought it was sort of ironic. The Native American, Native peoples, whatever you want to call them, in California have a tribe. I don't remember its name. It was on the radio this morning. They built a casino, and suddenly the tribe of 1,800 members has all this money coming in. Now, Native American tribes are their own nation. They are not subject to regular court system, the U.S. Constitution, or whatever. U.S. police cannot go in there and do anything. So what did the tribal elders do? They held an election, 
They lost, and they said, tough. We're going to stay the tribal elders. But what we're going to do is expel everybody who we think is not a real member of this tribe. Because that means more money for the rest of us, doesn't it, from the casino. So what they're undergoing now is they've expelled half the tribe, and everybody who's expelled who has a relative who is a member of the tribe, but works at the casino, has been fired, all in the name of greed. And that's what capitalism promotes. It's not, you know, if I said I want to be real greedy, but it's going to benefit the rest of the world, I've never seen it. Did the nobility that existed in the uh, 16th and 17th century Europe, did their greed for having land and, and horses and all that, did that go down to the French peasant or the English yeoman? No. Another thing is, uh, a speaker mentioned socialism in the sense that it can't work, it's never been done successfully. Well, you go tell George Washington that a republic has never worked, it can never be done, and you'll never have a democratic republic anywhere in the world. Because the only republics that ever existed, whether it was Rome, or the Swiss republics, or Italian republics, they all collapsed you know, under their own corruption. So back then, there was no such thing as a republic, and nobody thought it could happen. And yet in a few short years, you had revolutions all through Europe, some failed, some succeeded. The German one, unfortunately, failed. Look what we had to do with that. But uh, you know, I, that's just one of the few things I wanted to say. Plus, religion is a tricky issue. I don't care what you, you, you believe. You can believe you know, in the great uh, cosmic muffin in the sky. It's when a religious organization becomes detrimental to our lives. Yeah. It starts repressing people, as the churches have done with women, with minorities, the Mormon Church excluded blacks. The Catholic Church subjugated women. That's when socialists step in and say, ah, 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 you don't got religious freedom for that. And you want to try, you'll end up in the jail. But as, well, as far as what you want to personally believe, who, Mark said, it's not even worth talking about. You know, It's like saying, I want to collect stamps. No, I want to collect coins. OK. Thank Yay. you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, when, one thing, one correction, uh, the Socialist Party's first convention was in Indianapolis, not in Chicago. <laughs> oh, so you're socialist now. He changed in 10 minutes. Socialist will let you smoke. He changed now. First of all, while I might disagree with Charlie about one or two things, um, I'm glad that he did try to come. He did give, again, an interesting talk. And as was once said about his very distant relative, why our journalist is brave, courageous, and bold for showing up here. Um, first of all, I would like to say, among other things, however, that regardless of what they stand for, I'm not usually an admirer of third parties. Um, while the Supreme Court did not help matters in the 2000 election, Yes, Ralph Nader's entry into the race was very detrimental to the Democrats. And I'm sorry, folks, that's exactly why we set the, set the ballot standards so high for third parties here in Illinois. What? Yep. That's why, to make sure that they do not get on the ballot and cause confusion. Oh! <laughs> and I speak as an old-time Chicago and Cook County Democrat. Just confusion. Hey, one fool at a time. <laughs> and I speak as an old-time Chicago and Cook County Democrat. Let there be no mistake about it. Yeah, who's yeah, absolutely just... <laughs> wrong. One fool at a time, Charlie. Keep him off the ballot. Now, with regard to Jimmy Carter, Carter was an intelligent man, and he meant well. But he was one of the most inept presidents we have had. Now, granted, he, granted, uh, the recent Bush made President Carter actually look good by comparison. And, but in Hell's Bells, Bush made James Buchanan look good by comparison. <laughs> um, Carter couldn't, it was Car during Carter's time, Congress was led by his own party. Hell, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama got more out of Congress led by an opposition party than Jimmy Carter ever got out of Congress. And in my view, Although I, I didn't, although I couldn't stand Ronald Reagan, I liked him as a person, but I didn't like his politics. I voted for Kennedy and Anderson in 1980, the only time I have ever voted for a third party. 
The only time I've ever done that, and hopefully the only time I ever will. Because Carter did not deserve to be reelected. He had done such a lousy job. Hell, inflation got started under Lyndon Johnson, and we had hyperinflation during the Carter era. The country was just falling apart. Um, that began under no. the other guy. <laughs> under, with regard to the comments that were made about how there's a recognition in, in communist countries of private party property, not necessarily. In Romania, for example, coin collectors of all people not only had to buy coins from a government-owned coin shop, they had to register their collections with the government, and when, they, when the coin collector died, you couldn't will or the estate couldn't sell the collection to somebody else. Instead, it, had, it went to the government, period. Um, with regard to the Quakers, I was in the subject of Nixon being a famous Quaker came up. Well, I'm not an admirer of Richard Nixon any more than most of the other people here in this room. But I will say this much, he was a cousin of Jesmyn West, who was a well-known Quaker, and he authored the book, The Friendly Persuasion. Uh, with regard to the subject of bankers, merely because I am a Democrat doesn't mean that I admire bankers. We once had a great president in this country by the name of Harry Truman, who among other things said, bankers, boy, there's a bunch of crooks for you. They're happy to lend you money when you can prove you don't need it. You want a friend in this life, get a dog. Uh, with re and with regard to the issue of churches and tax exemption. Now, I'm against the abuse of tax exemptions by anyone, and not only by churches. But having said that, they are non-for-profit institutions. When they carry out their legitimate purposes, I have no objection to get getting a tax exempt status. That includes my temple I belong to downtown Chicago Sinai. I'm sure it gets a tax exempt status as well it should. Uh, with regard to issue of Israel, I'm sorry folks, we've tried a one-state solution uh, once before when the Turks had control of the Middle East. The Jews had to pay a tax just in order just in order to exist as Jews. We're not going to be put through that again. The bottom line here is a two-state solution, a separate Jewish state and a separate Palestinian state is the only answer, period, end of story. Uh, with regard to the subject of Socialism and music that was talked about. Well, or I should say socialism and the arts. Well, we have to be careful here. Stalin has said the only kind of music he was in favor of was music that commissars could whistle. Um, finally, on the, my last two points, a united front was tried. It was tried in France during the 1930s, and it fell apart. In the end, France fell to the Nazis. So I'm not entirely sure that a united front is the answer. I'm not saying it's not the answer, but I'm saying that perhaps that should be thought out a little more carefully. And last but not least, to the speaker who said that, well, the Nazis used the socialist label. That's bullshit. The Nazis used the socialist label only as propaganda, only as a trap to bait the masses. They weren't socialists. And anybody who's bothered to study the Nazi party in its program knows that. Thank you. So you need how to study more. My only comment tonight to this group is to simply say this. Where have you been for the last 20 years? Have you not known the rapid change that society has gone through through the power of innovation? Specifically the development of the internet, perhaps cell phones, perhaps Facebook, perhaps Google, perhaps a lot of other ways that our lives have been made better by the integration of electronic technology and industrialization. Has anybody ever really looked that the United States has lost its manufacturing capacity. 
Yes, there are less people involved in the manufacturing sector, but we're making much better goods than we did even 30 years ago. What a bullshit you talking Now, Frank, Frank, I'm going to tell you something right now. You know, you, you take a look at all these environmental cars and everything else going around. Right now, Detroit has been, for the first time in many years, started on the innovation curve. Oh, yeah, let's make cars that people want to buy. What a concept. We are now seeing, if you look outside right now, hybrid automobiles. We're seeing the beginnings of a, a true electric revolution in, in uh, automobile production to get rid of these uh, gas-guzzling SUVs or whatnot. But what many of you re don't realize is that gasoline still is a valuable, very energy-efficient commodity. In, in things. Electric trains have been around for a hundred years. Charlie, we know electric trains have been around for a hundred years, but you know, when you what? guys really the think about it, what? when you guys think about things and the way you want to change things, you have a lot more power than you realize. The only reason Walmart has become the large dominant corporation in, the, in America is because people go there to shop, to buy things that Walmart does. The reason why many of these larger corporations come to dominate these powers is that they get your money that you spend on them. And the only reason that we have a vibrant industrial economy is because you buy the things that people make. Now granted, I may not like a lot of the things that some of the bankers in Wall Street do. I may not like the fraud that goes in here. And for me, the, my own opinion on the banking crisis is that we didn't let capitalism work. We didn't let these large institutions go bankrupt, which is exactly what should have happened under a capitalistic system. We bailed them out. Socialism for the rich. The problem is, is that we don't let large institutions go bankrupt, which is why we're seeing a, seeing a lot of the failures of a modern capitalistic economy. For me, it's very simple. This system of capitalism has provided innovation for the last 300 years, brought many people out of poverty and onto some good, solid paying jobs over the years. And for me, you know, it's still going on. We may see a little stagnation here in the United States, but if you look around the rest of the world, they are industrializing, finally. Finally, we're seeing Africa get out of its malaise over these many years because they're finally industrializing and, and, and going together. We're seeing globalization take around the world with increasing uniform standards that mean people can talk to each other. And yes, we're going to probably see some form of world governance in the next few years. I foresee over the next hundred years a good and glorious and peaceful world. It's going to be based on a lot more cooperation than war. It's going to be based on the fact that we need to innovate further. And believe it or not, folks, our global warming problems will not be solved by some government regulation, by the, by the immense, by the immense uh, wind and solar. It's going to be done by some form of nuclear power generation. The only argument I make there is E equals MC squared. The amount of energy times the mass times the speed of light squared is much, much more efficient power source than no. something you get from a chemical fossil no fuel. No energy, no energy. And, you know, like it or not, <laughs> there is innovation coming in these fields. Well, no, we don't need to slow down the pace of change. We need to keep it going and let the market decide what comes oh. forward. Thank you very much. <laughs> What do you live in Earth? And it's cold. What's in Earth? You don't know where you're living. You are somewhere in the space. Uh, hello, my name is Miguel El Toro. I am a new member of the party. And I joined the party because I realized that the system is indeed corrupt at the very foundations, despite the fact that, as people said, innovations are what has brought this country to what it is, as though it, as true as that might be, socialism is, a, it's an ideal, it's an ideal in which um, is 
which has its foundations in the basic tenets of human decency. And from the economic standpoint of socialism, it also has a bit of capitalism in it in regards to, uh, in regards to property, individual property and such. However, the difference lies in the mode of production as well as the um, ownership of production and that can be a major difference between capitalism and socialism, which is why I personally joined the party. And when I joined, I would like I, I was actually looking for uh, uh, organizations, rallies, groups, especially for the youth in these days. And I rarely found any, especially here in the Midwest. Um, I heard a couple in Madison, Wisconsin, some in Indiana, but none in Illinois. And I agree with this gentleman about uh, collaboration between left parties, uh, anarcho-syndicalists, uh, other socialist branches in the United States, as well as the Green Party to bring a voice to those who are most, uh, those who are most uh, oppressed. oppressed, suppressed, as well as those who are uh, those whose voices cannot be heard through either political or economic reasons. And what I want to see more is more involvement of the youth in this organization through maybe campus rallies, campus programs, uh, recruitment about the true fundamentals of socialism that doesn't revolve around the stigma lying in the 1950s past with uh, the Red Scare, most, uh, most famously propagated by uh, John McCarthy. Yep. McCarthy, during the no, Bill McCarthy days. Who Ronald Reagan gave the list of his... And when he was president for the economy... The screen Actors Guild gave his own money. I do believe that <laughs> innovation is a massive part of the economy, and Reagan. it is true today we are more innovative than we were 100 years ago. However, the innovation is not the issue there. Uh, the issue is the distribution of wealth within these companies, as well as the corruption that leads to the detriment of the working people across the world, especially South Africa, Sorry, uh, Central and South America with free trade, which totally decimated the economies. As a result, uh, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, which has left these uh, regions in perpetual debt, as a result of free trade, has also led to the loss of jobs in the United States. And the only way for us to proceed to a more innovative, more equal future in this country would be to transition from a capitalist to a socialist economy, not through immediate, immediate social, ch uh, immediate economic changes, but rather through gradual legislative changes, slowly leading to an eventual degradation of the capitalist system. So less lives can be negatively impacted in the transition process. Sorry. Uh, and I would like to see more participation as well as more outreach to the youth in this organization to further the progress of uh, justice, um, social justice, as well as economic freedom. Thank you. Uh, my name is Doug Binkley. Uh, some of you know I've uh, spoken before uh, sometimes uh, and I've admitted to being a socialist, although um, I, I kind of uh, think that that term has been vilified so much and the um, right has co-opted co the um, uh, interpretation of it to such an extreme in this country that uh, back when I was involved in politics, uh, I was, uh, when I was with the Citizens Party, uh, and a lot of mention has been made about Jimmy Carter and uh, Reagan, uh, Citizens Party uh, ran Barry Commoner, environmental uh, candidate in 1980. Uh, we were behind him, uh, uh, but uh, our thunder was um, uh, stolen by uh, this uh, John Anderson, a, a Republican uh, liberal uh, congressman who ran, uh, and primarily his big thing was that he was going to raise the gas tax. Uh, 
Uh, and he did get over 5% of the vote, and we got him easily like a quarter of a percent. Uh, um, the pr problem with which we had then, uh, which is the same problem that exists now for third parties, um, and um, uh, it isn't the third parties that, uh, that cause this. Uh, in, in many countries, um, there's an electoral system where you have a runoff uh, if uh, no candidate gets a majority of the vote. And um, the uh, problem that occurred in the 2000 um, election, which has been mentioned here, um, it was not necessarily uh, Ralph Nader's fault. Uh, if we had a system whereby there was a runoff uh, election, um, then there would have been an opportunity for, say, late in November for um, uh, Gore and, um, and George W. Bush um, to have had a redo, as it were, and uh, uh, very plausibly uh, Nader's uh, uh, votes would have gone mainly to, uh, to Gore. And so, uh, uh, if all things being equal, uh, Gore would have run that runoff, I maintain. Uh, uh, so, um, there are a lot of problems. I mean, I'm behind the speaker 100%, I think, or at least 95% of all the things he said. Um, the Citizens Party uh, in 1980 was totally in favor of um, uh, reduced work week and um, uh, nationalizing the banks and the oil companies also was part of the, uh, the platform. I'm not, not certain about nationalizing the banks, but certainly nationalizing the oil uh, companies. So. But um, um, we need to have this uh, uh, runoff um, uh, possibility in the electoral um, mechanics. So uh, now, uh, it, not too long ago, I don't know exactly when, but um, it was proposed that there could be uh, an automatic runoff, so you wouldn't even have to have the uh, uh, expense of a, a second election um, if uh, neither candidate got to a majority of the votes. So, so what would have happened in uh, Gore versus uh, uh, Bush 2000 is that uh, people would have voted their first preference, their second preference, possibly a third, fourth, fifth preference if necessary. I mean, people aren't that intellectual in this country. Maybe they would go bonkers if they had to um, give three or four preferences. But at least uh, people who wanted to vote for Nader would have put in him as their first preference on a ballot or in an election um, a machine, um, voting machine. And uh, then their second preference could have been for Gore or Buchanan or whoever. <laughs> Certainly the people that accidentally voted for Buchanan, which is one of the reasons why or Gore lost was that fake, phony, or messed up ballot where people voted for Buchanan who thought they were voting for Gore. If there was an automatic runoff system, um, then at least they probably would have gotten their second choice right for Gore if they voted accidentally for Buchanan, or their third choice would have been for Gore after their second choice was for Nader, or whatever. I mean, it would have, um, this automatic runoff system uh, would have prevented this disaster that we got with George W. Bush. So, um, you can blame Nader because it, we have the bad system uh, now, we still have the bad system, but uh, if we were to change that system somehow, which uh, may or may not require uh, something to do with the Constitution, but it might be as simple as um, uh, the states instituting, um, you might be able to do without a con constitutional amendment, I don't know, uh, instant runoff um, um, whereby um, people would be able to voice their true feelings, either vote for socialists or vote for Green Party or whatever as their first choice, and then and then go ahead and vote for the lesser two evils, Democrat, second or third down the line. Um, so um, um, I just wanted to put that in because I didn't hear that mentioned anywhere tonight. I don't wear this nose because I think socialism is a joke. I just think there are many jokes in this world. And Socialism is just one of them. But I have a little, <clears throat> I have a poem to read before, after I say a little history. Um, there was Salvador Allende, was in Chile, Chile, to Americans, in 1973, which was 9-11-73. And he was bombed by, and killed by American planes, sadly because it was a socialist government and the CIA didn't want socialist government there so they just killed the guy 
So I mean, it leads right to my poem. And, and then after my poem, my wife will sing a little song, Lana Weinberg will sing a little socialist song called Moscow at Night. I'm from the socialist country of Russia. Okay, this is my poem. Gotta take off my nose, can't see. Socialism isn't here. Socialism isn't here. Socialism is Cuba. Socialism is North Korea. Socialism is social. Socialism is like social security. Viva la raza. Socialism is public libraries. Socialism is free. Socialism. 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 Okay, now here's my wife to sing a song. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, this song from Russia, but I will try. Okay, um, it's called Moscow at Night. I guess you know this tune. You're familiar with this, and if you would like to participate, it's going to be great, like something different, right? Okay. Не слышны в саду даже шорохи. Все здесь замерло до утра. Если б знали вы, как мне дороги подмосковные вечера. Если б знали вы, как мне дороги подмосковные вечера. Что ж ты, милая, смотришь из коса, Низко голову наклонял, Трудно бы сказать и не высказать Все, что на сердце у меня. Трудно высказать и не высказать Все, что на сердце у меня. Alright, let's see, we've got so much to cover, but first of all, let's thank our speaker again for coming again. And we've gotten positive feedback, by the way, on your presentation, at least informally. Um, be eclectic as usual here. Um, regarding the difference between capitalism and socialism, is I, I don't know what directions you are all going. Basically, it's I'm going to give you an incontrovertible fact. There's not a lot of these in the world, but I'm going to give you one. Under capitalism, you end up with something called social stratification. And it's a hierarchy, meaning you have an unequitable distribution in your society. And it's stratified. There's no change. No, you are solidly in it. The current stratification in the United States is totally unacceptable. He alluded to it briefly. He said not even 1%. It's more like 5 or 10% control all the wealth and resources. And if you were to make the bottom of the floor, the poverty line, made this a graph, that 10% would be about 10 miles up there. If this is your ideal, is this your concept of an ideal society? I don't know what basis you're using. Um, he comes along and he says, no, that's 
incorrect. We don't want a society that is controlled by CEOs and multinational corporations are answerable to, we're not chosen by anyone, not chosen by the people, do not have the interests of anyone in, except themselves. If you want them to be in charge in a hierarchical structure, then choose it. I, I don't know. He comes along and says, no, there should be a leveling. A process where, where it, it, the goods are some measure of equitable distribution. And he even goes so far as to say it should be from the bottom up. It was a very good concept here. But for some reason, some of you missed this. I don't know why. It's not very difficult to figure out. If you think we would, there are fewer, there's another incontrovertible fact. Under this free market capitalism, very, there's something that disappeared. It's called the American dream. It's not going to return under the present system. It's going to become impossible. And this is where you're headed. If that's the direction you want, you can go that route and you don't have to listen to Charlie here. But that just be a mythical thing. And people are realizing that the next generations are not going to have what the previous generations have. And unless you do something radical like listen to this guy, I think you better change the course. Now, Tim, I'm going to jump around here a little bit. Um, you're telling me Detroit is designing, oh my, he tells us Detroit is not coming up. <laughs> the great innovation is coming up with the electric vehicle. The electric vehicle has been around since the previous century. I give a lecture yeah. on that. You can year. take one, you could build 20 or 40 cars, or you could build one L car. They'll last 50 or 100 years. That's the choice you make. And that's the choice that capitalism will give you. You can have one L car or 40 or 50 cars. This is what your free market gives you. And no one will step in and change that. Now the other thing, historically, what are you beating up on Carter for? Where do you get that thing he's responsible for inflation? Gerald Ford, I still have a button called win. We have inflation <laughs> now. It began under Gerald Ford. It started under I didn't know it was not. It was under Ford. He had the campaign, so don't blame Jer Jimmy Carter for inflation when he had all kinds of things. Yeah, God, no, you said he came up here and you said he was responsible for inflation. No, now, why did he have a campaign called Win if there was no inflation under Ford? Now, I've been a member of the Carter Institute for years, and he happens to be one of the greatest presidents we have because he was something we haven't seen in a long time called a statesman. Now, you were telling us, Bob, he didn't get us into war in the Middle East. How much did you tell me earlier we were spending on this silly thing? Over $7 trillion. $7 trillion. That they know of. We could have been spending on ourselves. But we spend that, and this is a bad president? What's a good president? One guy, Carter, spent seven trillion dollars on us? That's what they know. <laughs> Instead of falling in, he should go, we should build statues to this guy. Unlike the other jamokes that came along later, are you kidding? Anyhow, I'll think of you guys. Uh, the other, last of all, there's no such thing as a church that's non-profit. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> there never has been, and there never will be. Anyhow, thanks a lot. Outside of that, join the party. Come on, let's get some numbers. Yeah. That's what they know. Yeah. That's what they know. Yeah. Oh, we should. Speaker gets the last yeah. word. How many minutes do I have? You get till 11 o'clock. You can speak it. Jimmy Carter caused the inflation. Ford inherited it. You can speak till we, the restaurant closes. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, I hope I did a better job taking some notes. If you want to be a member, I got some membership forms here. See me. See Art. But Art, Reagan started. Art brought in a stack of the latest. This is the not the latest, but it's not the latest. The latest. Was, this is the last. Not, this is the final issue of uh, last year, 20, of yeah. 2012. What, it's on environmental, people, on the environment. Uh, well, these are, it says two bucks. Uh, how much do you want? If you, you want to. Still, we're giving away. Give it away, all right? And it's it's free, comrade. It's free. <laughs> in socialism, everything is free. Okay. Um, <laughs>
Okay. Um, okay. Spending on the um, I, I had. I want to. I want to talk about the future because uh, Miguel talks about the youth, and and this is a poll that has been um, around since at least 2010, and I saw a newer version of it. If you are under 30, an iPad. The under 30 generation is evenly split between computer. they prefer capitalism to socialism. Even split if you're 30 or under. Now 40 and up, everybody, most people prefer capitalism. I'm 50, so I'm kind of in between the older generation that's scared of the Reds and the younger generation that's beginning to think maybe there's something we haven't tried. So I think the younger generation is where the strength is going to come from for a new socialist anti-capitalist movement. Yeah, you say socialism doesn't work, but I will say this, capitalism doesn't work for most people. That's why you have this 90 to 10 percent split where most people are poor can barely make ends meet. Um, I understand what you're saying about the two-state solution, but we've been talking about a two-state solution in Israel for how many decades? Do we really believe Israel is ever going to allow a two-state solution? The solution is incorporate the Palestinian no, people into the state of Israel and give them equal rights. All right, all right. I won't. I won't go there. I'm not. I'm not anti-Israel. I'm saying we should encourage Israel to incorporate Palestinians and into their states and, are secular, never allow and to secularize the state. They but want to ethnically cleanse all of them. All right. All right but here, here we go. Uh, the next one, Ralph Meir. I I firmly believe that Al Gore won the 2000 election and the statistics, as a political science major, the statistics support my view. He won the state of Florida. If there had been a louder recount, he would have won that state. But why did he not have a recount? The Supreme Court stopped the recount. They gave the election to Bush and they were Republicans on the court. End of story. Um, all right, left unity. Um, there is actually a lot of talk, and I think I think there is actually some talk, not necessarily green to socialist unity, but socialist unity. Um, Art posted a our article where a member of the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism, which is a group of ex-Communist Party members, are proposing an umbrella of the Democratic Socialist, the Communist Party, Democratic Socialists of America, not the Socialist Party, uh, the uh, Freedom Road Socialist Organization, and I forget who the fourth one was, but they were, they're arguing that those four organizations should create an umbrella. I'm in favor of that. I think the Socialist Party should be included in CP, that. CP, Communist the, Party. Was the Communist Party, Social, Freedom Road, Democratic Socialists, and another big socialist organization were, should be all together. I think there should be smaller groups like us included in such a big thing, because I believe the rising generations, are, the rising generation is for socialism or at least enough of them are. So I believe that. As far as the Greens, I mean, I'm an eco-socialist. I believe the Greens should, or the, the Socialist Party cannot do without an environmentalist and without a green element. But I, I think nothing, there's a, okay, and I'm gonna hear tie into the word communist just a little bit. I call myself a communist and a socialist. Um, there were three traditions of communism. There is the anarchist tradition, there is the Marxist or Leninist tradition, and then there is the uh, religious communist. I'm a religious communist. So I believe, I, I believe in communism as the, the, and nothing says you are anti-capitalist like the word communism. Socialism in Europe, socialists and communists, get, capitalists get along fine. Um, anyway, I won't, I won't do a whole lot on that piece. Um, let me see, I took a few other notes, but I think I'm about through here. Um, anyway, I thank you guys for letting me yeah. say what I had to yeah. say. Um, and join the social party if you're interested at all. Uh, see me your art. Okay. Don't hold back. Thank you all for coming. And Carter and Sven. I'm happy to mess up. Jimmy or Billy with you about Ronald Reagan. He's really a wild guy. What you see? Yeah. Yeah.